Okay, so let's get started today. Today's going to be a pretty good example of how many of the lectures I hope will run this semester, where I'm going to do a little bit of lecture and also have you do a bunch of um, in-class exercises to get you um, practice with different concepts. And today's focus is on lab one to get you some exercises that are going to help you do lab one and also um, some a review exercise with vectors to get you uh, back up and running with vectors. A couple quick announcements. I pushed the deadline for lab 0 0.5 back till um, Saturday morning at 6 a.m. So effectively due Friday evening. But it's due Saturday morning at 6 a.m. That's now a hard deadline. You won't be allowed to submit after that because you need to get started on lab one. So that's a hard deadline, Saturday morning at 6 a.m. Also, I will have office hours today from 2.30 to 3.30 to make up for the fact that I had to cancel on Tuesday. And also, it's because some of you may... Oh, come on. Why are we having this issue? Suck. Okay, so office hours today, 2.30 to 3.30 in MK312. So if you're having an issue with lab 0 0.5 or lab 1 or something to do with command line interfaces, I will be there. I may be a couple minutes late, but just hang on. I will definitely be there. So those are the announcements. And as... For today's lecture, it is covering strings and vectors. And most of what is in Dr. Plank's notes, you have already seen. So there's just a couple things I'm going to review with his notes. We're going to primarily today be focused on character arithmetic because that's a big focus of the first part of lab one and also lab 0 0.5 and then we're also going to be giving you an exercise where you're going to be working with CN and distinguishing between numeric and non-numeric uh, data. So to get started I actually want you to all try out a Zianti exercise. So I did not assign this one, but I think it's a good one to go over because it makes clear some of the issues that come up with CN. So it's 11.15.5. And um, if you don't get, have the laptop with you, you need to try to do this by, I think, I'll have to check, but you need to do it uh, certainly by... Uh, tomorrow morning. So I'm going to put it up. So if you didn't bring your laptop, remember it's important you bring your laptop because we're going to be doing this all semester long. So again, the exercise is 11.15.5. I'm just going to put it up here on the screen. I can't get it all up, so actually maybe if I project, nope. Anyway, any rate, get started on it. Not going to give you a lot of time. You're going to get about five minutes.
And feel free to work on this with a neighbor. No, you do not need to do this through Canvas. We're going to push it up. You're reading into first string and then into second string. Okay, let's go over the answers quickly. I know those of you who had it, you can check it. So basically, this exercise is supposed to be showing you that CN reads a word at a time. It doesn't read a line at a time. That's get line that reads a line at a time. And also that where it stops reading is at white space. So the first one is you might think that it's just going to read my, but it's really going to read my exclamation mark. And I should, uh, my exclamation mark. There we go. So it reads all the way up to white space or the end of line character. So the end of line character is considered a white space character. So is a space. So it reads up to the first white space character, which in this case, we don't know whether it's another space or it's new line, but it doesn't matter. It reads the exclamation mark. Second case, Frank is read into first string and Sinatra is read into second string. And that's just, um, should be pretty clear from 302. I'm sorry, 102. For three, the answer is going to be dot, 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 no, exclamation mark. Okay, and the reason is that O, dot, 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 gets read into first string. And then there's a lot of new line characters here, but those are considered white space. So the next non-white space starts at this dot, 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 and it reads all the way through to the next white space character, which is after the exclamation point. And finally, on four, the answer is all. Okay? 
And the reason it's all is because, again, the first CN only reads one word, not the entire line. So the first CN reads we into first string, and the second CN reads all into second string, and no is still left on the input stream at this point, ready for the next CN. So questions about that? Yes? So if you were to use um, uh, get line, mm -hmm. instead of CN for we all, it would get the whole line. Correct. And if you were to try to see in the second string, you wouldn't get no, you would just get a space afterwards, right? You might get issues depending on, so that's where you shouldn't use get line and CN um, together in the same program because it a lot depends on what's after. It, it's, I think, based on what I know, if you use get line, that should get we all, and I think CN should get no next, based okay. on the behavior I <coughs> understand. So if you're getting a space that really shows that the behavior of get line and CN is unpredictable. Yep. Okay? It's, I guess bottom line is you shouldn't do it because it's not a portable solution. Different platforms will probably handle it differently. So just don't mix them. I think the answer is yeah. you don't know. It's platform dependent. I'm doing it on a Mac, you're doing it on a Windows box, it looks like. Our Hydra machines are yet a third installation, so um, just don't mix them, <laughs> it's bottom line. Okay, other questions? Okay. Let's move then into character arithmetic, because that's something that you're looking at for both um, Lab 0 0.5 and... Lab one. And the TAs, did the TAs go over ASCII codes yesterday in the lab? A little bit, but I actually don't think it hurts to repeat them here. A professor that was here when I first came used to say that repetition is the key to learning. And why is that? Because repetition is the key to learning. So sometimes hearing it multiple times helps. And I think this is one of those times because it doesn't necessarily always make sense that you, we're thinking in terms of characters like A, B, or capital A, capital B, or we're thinking in terms of digits 0, 1, 2, but that's not how they're getting represented. I don't see actually that thing going, so I don't think it's an emergency alert. Okay, so the computer can't represent things as characters. It represents them actually as bits. And characters and number, well, characters, and actually in this case, if you're representing these as characters rather than as numbers, they are represented using one byte. Okay, and a byte is how many bits? Eight. Okay, and there are two ways to represent things in this world, character codes. There is ASCII, which is what Unix and Linux uses, and there is something called Unicode, which is what Java and some other languages use. C uses ASCII, and so that's what we're going to use in this course. So both systems are a way of essentially representing characters as integers. And ASCII actually runs from 0 to 127. So there's other characters like punctuation, so like a comma, a period, they also have integers associated with them. There are also so-called non-printable characters. Okay, you have seen some of them. Backslash S is a space. That has an integer code associated with it. The new line character has an integer code associated with it. So these are non-printable characters. They don't print anything on the display. A blank space appears for a space. For a new line, it causes a new line to occur. But all of these have integers associated with them. And by doing a Google, you can actually pull up what that association is. So if I just say ASCII table, I'll get lots of them. Okay, and let's go back. Let's get an actual table. So here's one, and it shows for every character, 
what, let's make that a little larger, what its integer decimal code is, what its hexadecimal code is, what its octo code is. So you can see early on, these are a lot of non-printable characters, but we get a space is decimal 32, a dollar sign is decimal 36, zero is 48, and you'll see that one important thing about these charts or tables is that if things are contiguous in like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 are contiguous, they're also contiguous in the integers assigned to them. So 0 is assigned to integer 48, 1 is assigned to integer 49. Okay, same thing with the capital letters. So the capital letters start here at 65, Okay, and again, contiguous. Capital B is 66, capital C is 67, so on and so forth. And finally, further down, we have A starting at integer 97 and going all the way up to 120 or 121 or so. Okay, so in memory, a character is actually represented as an integer. So the character A is represented by the integer 97. And you, we can take advantage of these pro integer properties to do arithmetic on characters. It's perfectly fine to do what is called character arithmetic. So in lab 0 0.5, you're told that nuggets of gold can be are represented by capital letters. A might be, uh, is A 0 or 1? I forget. It's 1, isn't it? A is 1, B is 2, C is 3, all the way up to capital Z, which is 26. So one way you could test in lab 0 0.5 to determine the value of a nugget is you could have 26 if-else statements. You could say if the character is equal to capital A, then the value is 1. Else if it's equal to capital B, it's 2. Else if it's equal to C, it's 3. Or you can do a big switch statement with case A is 1, case B is 2, case C is 3, but that's pretty inefficient as far as writing it out. There's a much better way to do it using ASCII arithmetic because we know that capital A through capital Z are represented by contiguous integers in the ASCII code. So we can, if we know that our, I'm going to call it the map character, so that's the character we just read, as long as we know that it is somewhere greater, whoops, I don't want that second quote there. Let the eraser know, where's my eraser? There we go. So as long as we know that the map character is between capital A and capital Z, we can actually get the value by saying map char, so the value is actually equal to the map char minus capital A. Is that going to give it the actual value? What if map char is A? We need to add one. But doing that arithmetic, instead of writing 26 if-else statements in one statement, I'm able to get the integer value. And this will return an integer, not a character, when I do this arithmetic. So I'm allowed to do arithmetic on variables declared as chars. This won't work with strings. You can't use a string variable to represent the map character. It must be declared as a char. But as long as it's declared as a char, you can do arithmetic on it. Okay? Are we clear on that? So, lab one is asking you to also do character arithmetic the first time. It's going to ask you to be creating patterns like a 
B, C, D, where you have a start character A, and then you're creating some repetitive sequence based on that character. So if, for example, it might be the length is 4 in this case, so we want, if the starting character is A, I want A, B, C, D. Now lab one's more complicated than this. However, I am going to have you write a short program where what you're going to do is take a start character, you're going to read it, and a length. So it's going to take two inputs, the start character and the length of the string that I want. And what you're going to do is generate a string of that length and then print it out. So if I give you the start character C and 4, you're going to generate the string C, D, E, F. If I give you Y and 4, you're going to generate the string Y, Z, and what do you think I want next? A, B. So you're going to have to wrap around. Okay. So what I want you to do is actually also store this in a string variable. So call it string result, maybe. And the reason I'm going to do that is to force you to use concatenation to show you how you can build up a string using concatenation. You could simply print each character as you generate it, but I don't want you to do that because I also want to give you some review regarding the concatenation character. So you're going to actually create the string called result and then print it out at the end. So here is your little assignment. Okay, read a character, here it is, read a character in an integer n and produce a string of length n that starts with that character and where each subsequent character is in the next letter in the alphabet. And if you need B, you need to wrap around. Okay, so I am going to give you about mm, 10 minutes for this one to 1145. Again, feel free to work with a neighbor on this one. So that's the program I want you to write. So you're taking two inputs, not from the command line, but from CN. And that's what you're doing. Feel free to work, collaborate with a neighbor on it. You can use either printf or C out. Actually, no. I'm going to make you use printf. So print it. Just print. Use printf because you're going to see why. Use a C++ string and use printf to print it out. I want to see if you remember something about how to extract a C string from a C++ string. Yes. Uh, what about header file is printf? Printf is going to be C standard I/O. So. The header file you need for printf is CSTDIO. That's printf. You have a question, raise your hand, and I'll come around and answer it. I am over my cold, so I'm not contagious anymore. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, copy that down because that's what I And you should be able to use ASCII arithmetic to get the next character. Okay, that's the point of this, is to use ASCII arithmetic to get the next character in your sequence. So you can assign one to a char to get B, 
B. You can assign 1 to B to get C. So you can also do assignment by adding 1 to chars to get the next char. If you're having trouble getting started, feel free to raise your hand too and I can come around.
I'm going to give you about a minute, and then I'm going to go over the answer. Okay, so I know on many of these you may not finish, that's okay, by forcing you to at least think about it. I think when I go over it, then you will be more interested in what I have to say, and something might click as well. So for this problem, you're asked to take a character and an integer as input. So I'm going to start with a character, I'm going to call it start char and a integer, which is going to be my string length. And then I also need a string for the result. Okay, so in 102 we often talked about you need to know what are your inputs, what are your outputs, and then you need to do something to transform your inputs to your outputs. So in this case, two variables for your inputs, one variable for your output. Now, Let's, st we first of all are reading from standard in, so we can read into the start char, and we can either say, we can chain it like that, if you remember chaining, that's fine, or you can put them on separate lines. I really don't care, it's a matter of preference. So that's reading my input. Yes? I don't have to include string because I, I know Dr. Plank says to do it, but it's automatically included in the IO stream library. So in this case, I don't care what Dr. Plank says. String is in the <laughs> IO stream library. Okay, the reason he's saying that is because you might not have the IO stream library, but almost every program is going to do IO, and the F stream library also has string in it. So yeah, technically I should have string there, but. I'm being a little lazy. IO stream is for CN. C standard IO guarantees that I get printf. On our Hydra machines, I need C standard IO for printf. Okay, feel free to ask questions or if I'm looking down to interrupt. Okay, so now I need to do something where I actually am going to assign things to the um, result string. So I need a loop for that. Okay, so the easiest thing to do is to loop from i equals zero to i up to length. So hopefully you remember this form of a for loop. It's a counting loop. Okay, it's going to execute length times. Okay. Pardon? I haven't declared i yet. So i is currently undeclared. So actually Either now or later, I can go back up here and declare I. 
probably a good idea to do it immediately so I don't forget. So what I'm going to do in my loop is assign the current character to result. And does anyone remember how you do concatenation? Plus equal. So I could either say result equals result plus start char. Okay, that's plus is the concatenation character. Or remember that there are shortcuts. You can say plus equals start char. Either one. I'm going to write it out just because it's, uh, I think, a little clearer. But that will concatenate whatever the character is to the beginning of start char. Now, I have to advance start char to the next character. How am I going to do that? Plus one. So the next thing I'm going to do is set start char to be start char plus one. Now, I am not going to worry initially about handling the wraparound. That's an important thing when you're programming is not to try to do everything at once. Do simple tasks first and then build up to more complicated tasks. So I'm going to put off for a moment the problem of what to do with wraparound. Okay, I'm just going to assume initially that I'm just trying to generate the string. Okay? So that loop should do the trick. I assign the current character, I add it to the end of result by concatenating, and then I advance the start character by one. That will advance it to the next letter using ASCII arithmetic. Okay, and when I'm done, again, I'm not going to yet worry about printf. I'm going to see out. I'm going to just quote, do the easier thing for the moment. And now I'm going to test my program. This is important development practice of doing a little bit at a time rather than trying to do it all at once. When you try to do it all at once, you'll easily make mistakes and it's harder to find where those mistakes are. So I called this pattern. No such file. Where am I? Never wrote it. Okay, so that compiled. Let's try it with A. Start with something simple, A and 1. And it's still sitting there. Something went wrong. Okay, let's see. Pattern A5, it's still sitting there. So something's wrong. Okay, this is why I start small. Okay. So, what do you think might be the first thing I can do to try to debug this? We need to start putting output statements to find out what's going on. Okay? Right, so in this case, I'm trying to read from the terminal. So. But I want to, I know that's the problem, actually. I was trying to, so, thank you. But what I want to do, the first thing I should do is put a C out right here and make sure that I am getting the right starting character and that I'm getting the right length. So the first thing is to put stuff at the very beginning to make sure that I'm getting the right inputs. Okay? So you start by very early on saying, am I getting the right inputs? And it's hanging. Nothing's happening. It's not even getting to these C out statements. So I know the problem. Now it's like narrowing down the problem like a detective. So now I know the problem is up here. It's not down here. It's up here. So I've fenced it in. I've slowly narrowed down where the problem is. It's not even getting to the CN. So as this gentleman over here said, the problem actually is I didn't give it input. I, I was thinking it was going to be on the command line. So in fact, I still have to give it input. It's sitting there waiting for input is the problem. So now let's give it input, A and 1. 
And now it works. Start character equals A, length equals 1, it prints out A. Let's try it with something a little more complicated. A and 4, whoops, let's do it right. A, 4, there we go. A, B, C, D. Let's start with something else. Pattern G and 10. Whoops, can't get myself off of that. G and 10. There we go. G H I J K L M N O P. Let's see what happens when we start with Z. Eh, y and 5. Hmm. Not what we wanted. But then again, we weren't trying to get it. Turns out that after Z, the next character is a curly brace, the next character is a bar, the next character is a right curly brace. So let's go to work on fixing the wraparound problem. Are we good so far with what we have? Okay, so let's worry about the wraparound problem. I'm going to take out my two debugging statements. So what do you think I should do if the start character has moved past Z? So, well, I can do a bunch of things. I could subtract 26. That's a good answer. But that's a little not as clear as simply setting it back to A. I prefer much, subtracting 26 is fine. It works. I think it's a little more clear that if start share is greater than Z, then we reset start char to A. Okay? Just, it's a little more readable. But subtracting 26 would have worked. Okay? But resetting it to A should do the trick. Okay, let's make sure that it does the trick. We'll compile and run it again with Y and 5. And sure enough, it is Y, Z, A, B, C. So I'm pretty happy, but there is, we talked about unusual cases in CS102. Now here I would guarantee that the length would be greater than 1. Greater than or equal to 1. So I'm not going to give you negative or 0. But what do you think might be a case I, that you might want to consider beyond the cases I've considered at this point? And also, I would guarantee the start character starts between A and Z. Okay, so maybe we could try it with capital letters. There we go. So we'll try C and 16. That looks pretty good. What happens if the length is greater than 26? Okay, so I haven't worried about cases where it has to wrap more than once. So you want to worry about big lengths. So let's try pattern and C and make it like 54. Is it going to work? Well, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, all the way to Y. There we go. It's going back to A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, K, R, S, T, V, W, X. Y, Z, A, B, yep, it wrapped around. So think about so-called boundary cases. In this case, something bigger than 26 is a boundary case. You want to make sure it works properly when you have to generate all of the letters that it wraps around in that case. Okay? Pardon? It won't work if you have a capital letter that wraps around. That's true. Good point. So I was assuming lowercase in this case. In fact, when I wrote the problem, I was thinking just lowercase. So the gentleman said, if you used a capital A, if you use capital letters, it won't wrap properly, and he's absolutely right. Then, whoever suggested subtracting 26, it works, because in that case, that's a more general solution. So minus 26 is a more general solution, because it works with both capital letters and lowercase letters. So that's a good example of knowing exactly what the input should be. Now, I promised you printf. 
So let's print it out using printf percent s. And I know this isn't going to work, but I want to do it intentionally. So that's the printf. It's percent s. I'm printing a string and then the new line character. And I need to write it. Whoops. And compile it. And it doesn't like it. And it actually said, did you mean to call the C string function? So printf is unable to print C++ style strings. You have to give it a C style string. And the way, if you remember from 102, that you get C style strings is with C underscore str. So what I actually did mean to say here was result dot str because that will return a C++ style string. So this is important because printf cannot print C++ style strings. So now if I write it and compile it, it should work again. And it does. Now, there is one very subtle bug here that's easy to catch, is easy to overlook, and most of the time won't affect the correctness of the program. But there is a subtle problem with this program. Does anyone know? I have forgotten to do something. I've, pardon? I don't assume any erroneous input. Assume all input is correct. The logic is pretty much correct in terms of calculating the string correctly, but there's something with the starting value of a variable that could be wrong. Pardon? It's not initialized. I never initialized result. I'm assuming it's going to start as an empty string, but that's a pretty big assumption. Okay, so you have to remember to initialize variables before you assign to them. So really, up here, I needed to set that equal to the empty string. Now, most C compilers will, when they create a string, set it to the empty string, but it's not a guarantee that it will be set to the empty string. So you need to remember to initialize stuff before you assign to it. I did have to initialize start char or length because they got initialized with the CN statements. I didn't have to initialize I because it got assigned zero here. But I never initialized res um, result until I said result equals result. Oops but result was never assigned anything. Okay, So it's very dangerous to assume that integers get assigned or initialized to zero, and it's dangerous to assume strings are initialized to the empty string. You really want to make that explicit. Okay? Okay. We good? Got this program because while it's not exactly it isn't quite lab zero. It can certainly help in writing labs not zero, lab one, the first part. Okay, because you're going to have to do a bit of arithmetic like this. Okay. So, there were a couple things in the lecture notes today that were worth going over. Okay, nothing in strings. Strings are all pretty, and nothing in getLine. You should be pretty familiar with getLine as well. And you should be pretty okay with vectors. So there are a couple things, though, you should have seen in 102. We did things with reversing a vector. So I'm going to pick it up with a vector where we are printing out the last n lines of C++. 
set reverse, that's reverse. So I want to print out the last 10 lines of a file. So if my file is this one right here, give me the weapon of power, blah, 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 I want to print out the last 10 lines. Okay, that's what tail does. It prints out the last n lines of a file. So I want to write a program that's going to print out the last n lines. So in order to do that, I'm going to have to store the lines of the file. So I declare a vector of strings, and I call get line because I'm reading lines, and I simply push those strings onto the back of the vector. So all I'm doing is storing all of the strings of the file, which in this case is coming from standard in. Okay? Now, I only want to print out the last 10 lines. So at the end, just ignore these two lines. Let's just go to here. Actually, he doesn't have it. So one thing that I could just blindly do is I could say for I equal lines dot size, because that's the number of lines in the file, minus 10, I less than lines dot size, I plus plus, and I could try to print it out. Okay, I could say C out lines I and del. So this should, this code that I've written, should print out the last 10 lines of the file, right? If the number of lines in the file is 30, 30 minus 10 is 20, so it'll start at 20, and it will go 20, 21, 22, 23, up to 29, which is correct. But why didn't he do it this way? Why didn't he simply write the loop this way? It's a very simple loop. <coughs> He did some mumble jumble here, which I'm going to describe, but why not just write the loop this way? He's worried about i being less than zero. Less yes. Than He's worried about i being less than zero, which could occur if the number of lines in the file is less than, less than 10. So he's worried about the, yes, you're less than 10, yeah. nine or less. So he's worried about the case. What if there's only five lines in the file? There's no guarantee that the file is greater than 10 lines. What if there's only five lines in the file? Well, all of a sudden, this is 5 minus 10. Whoops. Core dump. Lines minus 5 doesn't exist. You'll get a segmentation fault because this is an out-of-bounds index. Or maybe you'll get a message saying out-of-bounds index. So he has to worry about the case where the number of lines in the file is less than 10. So that's what he's doing here. He's subtracting 10 from lines.size. And if i is less than 0, he resets i to 0. Okay, so let's say the number of lines is 5. 5 minus 10 is minus 5. He resets i to 0. Now he's going from 0 up to Five, which is correct. So he's just making sure with these two lines of code, he's handling the case where the size of the file is less than 10. This is where comments are good. Okay? It would be very helpful if right here there were a comment that says, make sure if the size of the file is less than 10, that i is not negative rather than trying to make you figure out what's going on there. Okay, so that's what's going on. Now, there is another way to do that. You could try to write it like this, and it seems like it should also work. So, what he's doing here, if you haven't seen this question mark idiom before, 
in C++, there is an idiom where you can write something like x equals some expression, true, false, boolean expression, question mark, and then you write a true expression, which returns a value if the boolean expression is true, then a colon and a false expression, and I usually put in parentheses, and what that does is if this expression evaluates to true, it evaluates this expression, which must be an expression, not an assignment statement, and it returns a value. If it's false, it executes the false expression. So what he's trying to do here is the same thing he's doing before. If line dot size minus 10 is less than 0, he's going to return 0 to i. Otherwise, he's going to set i to be line dot size minus 10. So he's doing the same thing he did before with the two statements, but he's just combining them. This won't work. Okay? If I compile it, let's try it actually, so you can see what happens. So let's take this code. And I'm going to replace these two lines with Oh wait, he's wrong program. So I have the wrong program, just a second. Let me get the right program. This is the right program. Okay, and I'm going to remove these two lines. Instead, I'm going to do what he had, which is i equals lines.size minus 10 less than 0, question mark, 0. Otherwise, I want it to be lines.size minus 10. I think I need a parenthesis there. I need to get rid of this. And you're right, I need a colon just a second. Okay, so this is the code he had. Um, actually, let's just get rid of this line and directly copy what he had. Shoot. I think that's right. Okay. So let's try to compile this. Did I miss a curly brace? Yeah, I missed a curly brace. Thank you. And on the Mac, I get a warning message. Warning. Lines dot size minus 10, comparison of an unsigned expression less than zero is always false. What's going on here? It turns out that lines dot size, so the compiler knows that a vector always has a non-negative value. A vector is always zero or greater. Okay? So, knowing that it's always zero or greater, it returns what is called an unsigned value. Do you remember from 130 what an unsigned number is? It's always positive. It has no sign. So, for convenience, it returns an unsigned number from lines.size. So, the compiler says, okay, this is an unsigned number. And it doesn't even bother looking at the rest of it. It says, okay, this whole expression is going to be an unsigned result. Well, can an unsigned number be less than zero? No. So the compiler is saying this expression is always going to be true. 
wait, it's always, it can't be less than zero. It's always going to be false, sorry. This expression will always be false. It can't be less than zero. So the false branch is always going to execute. So that's what this warning is all about. Comparison of an unsigned expression is always false. So it would replace this expression with lines.size minus 10, which is not what we want. So there's no way to fix the problem other than to move this code out of the for statement and assign lines.size minus 10 to an int and then things work properly. So that's why he couldn't combine, go back up to here, he couldn't combine these two statements and simply put them down here. It wouldn't work. Up here, because you're assigning the i, it realizes that the result could be negative, and so it goes ahead and subtracts the 10 and does the right thing. Kind of silly in my opinion, but it is what it is. You don't want to get caught with that thing. The bottom line is that the size is an unsigned number, and the compiler assumes it's always positive. And it could bite you if you're not careful. Okay. Last thing for today is I was fact, I'm still going to do it. I want you to at least think about it for five minutes. I am going to go back to here. So the other day on Tuesday Not here. See, so look at. Let's look at my code from Tuesday. That wasn't it. Um, where was it? Print.cpp. There we go. Okay, here's my code from Tuesday. I was reading in input and I was discarding bad numbers. What I want you to do is just think about how this code could be modified. Let's say that I was giving you a file, because this is what will happen in the second part of lab one, that has student scores like 10, 30, 40, Brad, 0, 5, Smiley, who's my dog, 6, 8, 10, 2, Nancy. And what you're supposed to do is read the numbers till you encounter a name. Then when you encounter a name, you should print the name and the average of that person's scores. Okay? You're going to do something similar to this in lab one, the second part of lab one, but it's going to be a little more complicated than this. You can use this code that I gave you on Tuesday. You can modify it to do what I'm asking you to do here, which is to read some numbers, then when you encounter a name, print out the average. So what I want you to do is spend a few minutes thinking about how you could modify this code so that instead of it simply printing out numbers, which is what it was doing before, now it's going to read numbers until it encounters a name. And when it encounters a name, it's going to print the name and the average of the numbers it's seen. Then it's going to clear 
the score and redo it for the next person. So spend a few minutes seeing if you can think how this code could be modified. You probably don't have time to copy it and write it, but see if you can figure out how you might modify it. You might doodle around in VI or on a piece of paper. Okay, let me just quickly give you the overview. So, there's two cases. If it's a number, what do we want to do? Start adding. So probably we need to keep a sum. And what else do we probably need to keep? We need to keep the number. So int num scores. Okay? Probably doesn't hurt to set them to zero. So if it's a number, instead of printf, we're probably going to be saying sum plus equals number and num scores plus plus. Right? So the other case is no longer, the else clause down here is no longer erroneous input. What is it now? It's a name. Else, it's a name. We still have to hit the reset button, but it's no longer erroneous input. What is bad input now? A name, so why don't we call it name? OK, 
Okay, so we could print out the name, and this isn't perfect, but you'll have to do some formatting. Okay, you'd have to do some formatting. What else do I need to do here? If I'm not careful, it could trip me up. I have to reset. Sum equals zero. Num scores equals zero. Otherwise, I'm just going to be adding in previous scores to previous scores. Okay? So you're going to have to expand upon this code. The second part of the lab two isn't quite as easy as this, but this gives you an idea of how you can modify the code that I gave you on Tuesday so that you can start doing the part of the lab that you will be doing part two of lab one. Okay? So good luck. You should get started with that. And I will see you on Tuesday.